The evidence is strong that Paul is speaking as a reasonable, honest man who knows what he is saying and why. His explanation is that Christ appeared to him and that he receives revelation. With such revelation, he credits the Old Testament and speaks a full message about the person and work of Jesus Christ as God's truth. We must decide if we believe he is credible witness. There is good reason to believe that he is. How can we trust that Paul's writings are true and authoritative? In this episode of Light and Truth, John Piper explores Paul's transformation and claims of receiving revelation from Jesus himself, demonstrating why his testimony is trustworthy and divinely inspired. This seminar was originally delivered at Bethlehem Baptist Church in September 2001. How can we justify the claim that the Bible makes for itself and credit the inspiration, inerrancy, and authority of all the books of the Bible. I'm going to talk first about Paul's testimony and how we credit Paul. So this is kind of a historical argument, and the other one will be a more theological, spiritual kind of approach. Why do we want to credit Paul's testimony? So here we are trying to to find historical warrant for crediting Paul's testimony. Why? Why should we care? Well, he claimed to write with words taught by the Spirit. We saw this last night, 1 Corinthians 2, 12. We've received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words or interpreting spiritual things to spiritual people. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. We'll say more about that in a minute in another place. But he teaches in words taught by the Spirit. If that's true, we want to know it. So how do we credit whether it's true? He said that the Old Testament scriptures were inspired and profitable. We saw that in 2 Timothy 3.16. So we want to know if uh, that's true, because that will undergird our confidence in the Old Testament. He made stunning claims about the universal authority of Jesus. Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Equality with God, this Jesus, before he was born but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. Therefore also God highly exalted him, bestowed on him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. So if these things are true, I want to know, because my whole history and life hangs on whether that's true about Jesus. Every knee is going to bow to him, either willingly or unwillingly. He was in the form of God before he came to earth. He came to earth. He became obedient. He died a death. God exalted him. Those are spectacular claims that this man is making. Does he speak the truth? Colossians 1, 16 16 to 18. For by him all things were created. So he's creator. He's your creator. He made you. Would you want to know that true or not? If, if somebody made you and you're not a, a collection of energy and chemical plus time, but a person made you the way you make a pie, only more amazing because he did it with less to work with, like nothing, when he created your soul, that's an important thing to find out. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, he made all that. He made bin Laden. He made everybody. All these, all things have been created by him and for him. For him. Wouldn't you want to know what everything is for? Everything is for? Well, that would give some unity to your life. That would give some direction to your labors in life. If you know what everything is for... What's milk for and pizza for and air conditioners for and cars are for and business is for and media is for and TV is for and sex is for and money is for? What's it for? Answer, if he's right, 
Jesus. Everything is for Jesus. Well, if that's true, it changes everything. We've got to know if this is true or not. I mean, I've staked my whole life. What a fool I've been. Get up here in this pulpit week after week, declaring with all my might that these things are so, if they're not so. He is before all things. In him, all things hold together. Wouldn't you, if you were a physicist, wouldn't you want to know that? <laughs> the molecules hold together. Weather systems hold together. Galaxies hold together. Solar systems hold together. The sea stays in its place and the mountains stay in their place because of Jesus. He is also the head of the body, the church. If you're a Christian, you belong to the church, you'd want to know that. Colossians 2, 9, in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Now, so that's why it's important. I mean, it just didn't get any more important. That's important to know whether Paul tells the truth or not. So how, is there a way to know he's speaking the truth? That's the issue. That's what the seminar is about. Well, how does Paul argue for his credibility as a spokesman for the living God? Paul is not oblivious to the problem. And in Galatians 1, he undertakes to say something which sounds like he's trying to help the Galatians credit his testimony. So he, put yourself now in the Galatians' shoes and say, we want to know, can this man be trusted? I mean, he's a killer. He's a murderer. And now he's starting to preach some pretty amazing things. So here's the way he argues. We have to decide, is this true or not? For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. These are not just human words and message you're getting here. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So his claim is that these amazing things he says about Christ and the Gospels was not learned by ordinary human means, but that he received it from Jesus Christ as a revelation. And then comes this word for, which shows you that he cares about giving a ground. If you draw a four, you say, I say this, for I say this, and this is the foundation of that. You use that kind of language all the time. The four introduces the basis or the foundation for I received it as a revelation of Jesus. All right, so what's his argument? For you have heard, you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. I'll stop right there. So what he does with his first premise in this argument is to say, you have access to knowledge here that you know is true, namely, I was one amazing Pharisee. I was ahead of everybody. I was a persecutor. I was advancing. You knew. I didn't believe this. Jesus was an absolute hoax as far as what I was concerned. I was on my way to Damascus to put people in jail. I didn't anymore believe this than the man in the moon. My conscience was clear. I was doing for God what he wanted done, namely to keep these pretenders from sweeping Jews into hell by their false 
messiahship. Just another one of those crazy rebellious pretenders that gets the Romans to crash down on us and make life hard. That's the way I was. You know that's the way I was. That's premise number one. Now here comes verse 15. But when he who had set me apart even from my mother's womb called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. I went to Arabia, and then I returned to Damascus. Then, three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas. And I stayed with him 15 days. But I did not see any of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And then he takes an oath. Now, in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Because he sees some possibility there that they'd say, oh, you're just making that up, even though that's credible. He gave him 15 days. He said, Cephas, you can go check this out. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown by the sight, by sight to the churches of Judea, which are in Christ. But only they kept hearing, he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they were glorifying God because of me. That's his argument. I was once utterly out and out moving towards the destruction of Christianity and advancing in Judaism. And now, 180 degrees, I am preaching Jesus Christ who appeared to me on the Damascus Road. And I want you to know I didn't get all this by running to flesh and blood or going up to Jerusalem or talking to the apostles, I went away. And only three years later did I get together and have a talk with Peter and the others. Now, the point there is to say I'm not dependent on them. Even though they have the apostolic tradition I'm not dependent on them for my authority. I got through a revelation of Jesus Christ my gospel. Now, he will say later that he faithfully handles the tradition of the apostles. But he does not say, I do it the way other people do it. I am one of the apostles. I had direct access to Jesus Christ. He called me. He set me apart even before I was born, made me his apostle. And I lay out my life here and the change that you see as the primary evidence of it. And I add that I didn't consult with them early on in my Christian walk, but went away to Arabia and came to my own God-given convictions about this. Now, let's ponder this argument. Let's see whether it has any warrant or any validity. Is there some historical control here that shows Paul is not free to fabricate? Well, there are several. Everybody agrees that he wrote Galatians. There's not a single liberal, radical scholar who denies to Paul Galatians. So we'll start there. They deny to him First and Second Timothy. They deny Ephesians, Colossians, Thessalonian correspondence. A lot of arguments about certain letters that Paul wrote, whether he wrote them. Nobody denies Galatians. Too many traits of his own personal way. Number two, the description of his pre-Christian days includes his passionate persecution of the church of Christ. You have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure. Luke confirms this in Acts 9, and of course they would have known it. They, 
In, in Galatia, they, they knew all this, and they could have easily falsified this had they wanted to or been able to. Now, this would be public knowledge, especially among those who oppose Christianity. They'd want to know very much about that. Third observation, or historical control. The description of his pre-Christian days includes his passionate devotion to the Jewish law and traditions. So this is public. This too would be public, verifiable knowledge. It's extremely unlikely that he could be fabricating this in, in a time and setting where falsification would be so easy. Four. Now, after his Damascus Road experience, he's 180 degrees opposed to what he gave his life to before and is claiming Jesus to be the Son of God and the Christian gospel to be the truth. They kept hearing, he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith. This change in Paul was also public among those who had known him on both sides of his conversion. Now, Paul is making claims for Jesus that are so universal, so demanding on the allegiance of everyone that he seems to have, and here, here seem to be the options that I could think of. He's lost his mind, and, and almost all these have been developed in scholarly ways to, to reject Paul's legitimacy. He's, he's, had, he's lost his mind, he's got a serious psychosis, something happened in Damascus, or he's a con man, I'm a great trickster, kind of an Elmer Gantry type. Or he's making an honest mistake as a sober and reasonable man, or he's speaking truth as a reasonable and honest man. Those are the possibilities that seem to me we would have to entertain for Paul to write all the crazy things that he writes about Jesus Christ if he's not true. So let's, let's think about each of those, and the historical likelihood or evidences for them. I think th th this is just putting into formalized thought, I think the way you intuitively go about crediting somebody's testimony. Somebody comes along and says, I saw such and such, and you, don't, you weren't there, and you don't know if that happened, so you can either try to find it on TV or try to find somebody else to corroborate or whatever, but you also immediately do a checklist in your head. Is this person crazy? Well, he hasn't always been crazy. Does he look like he's having an illusion? Are there some traits here of some psychosis? No, he seems to be normal. You, you, you run through this mental checklist, and to the degree that you have some experience with this person, your credibility, I mean, his credibility rises and, and, and falls. And that's what we're trying to do with Paul. The writings of Paul do not fit the way lunatics or psychotics speak. His writings, like Romans, are reasoned in an extended and coherent way. His writings bear the marks of many warm personal relationships. His writings bear the mark of much interest and concern with others. Now, I, I, if you say, where'd you come up with this list? Or why, why are you mentioning those things? These are the things, I know a lot of, of, of schizophrenics. And there's a lot in this neighborhood. And, and you talk with people who have mental problems over the years long enough, you learn certain traits that, and you're trying to figure out what is it about this person that's not normal? I can't quite figure out why it is. And then you start to realize this person never has any thought about anybody by himself. Things like that. And there are certain traits of people who are mentally ill, and these are the ones that I'm saying Paul doesn't manifest. His writings bear the marks of many warm personal relationships. Mentally ill people don't have warm personal relationships. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about serious mental psychoses here now. I don't mean depression and things like that. His writings bear the mark of much interest and concern with others. Psychotic people are just unbelievably wrapped up in their own, in their own uh, world. His writings evidence a wide range of normal emotions. 
In general, no one would get the impression from these 13 letters, this man's insane. So I, I'm not inclined to think that that's a very good solution to what he says, that he's insane. So here's my second response. The price Paul was paying to be a Christian and an apostle rule out the idea that he was using it as a platform to con others. He proved repeatedly that he was not being driven by money. He was a tent maker. He didn't take offerings for himself. He had others handle offerings when he was trying to collect the money for the saints in Jerusalem. This man was not driven by greed, not driven by money wasn't using this message as a platform to con others. He accepted suffering constantly and documented it in a way that was publicly verifiable. I don't, I don't think I'll take the time to, to read these accounts of his suffering, but he documents them in a way that people can say, that isn't true. You've never even been on the sea, or you've never even been in the country, or you never had trouble with false brethren. He, they could document whether that was so or not. So I conclude, to say that Paul is making an honest mistake as a reasonable man is to miss the point. The problem is not just that he might have made an honest mistake in his conversion, which would be inexplicable enough. The problem is that he goes on year after year making the most outrageous claims about his own revelatory experiences and the reality of Christ and the Holy Spirit and the nature of reality. This is not an honest mistake. This is a lifetime of sustained delusion or deceit if he's not telling the truth. You can't say, well, the poor Paul, he's an honest and good man, and he made a few honest mistakes. He is not making a few honest mistakes. He's making many dishonest mistakes, or he's crazy. The evidence is strong that Paul is speaking as a reasonable, honest man who knows what he is saying and why. His explanation is that Christ appeared to him and that he receives revelation. With such revelation, he credits the Old Testament and speaks a full message about the person and work of Jesus Christ as God's truth. We must decide if we believe he is credible witness. There is good reason to believe that he is. Now, I didn't used to argue this way. I didn't used to, to develop it like this, but I've been preaching now for 20 one years, and before that I taught for six years, and before that I was a Christian for all my life since I was six years old. And so I've, I've lived with Paul and, and Matthew and Mark and Luke and John for a long, long time. And I have had my faith threatened and challenged by almost every conceivable side. There may be new challenges that emerge that I haven't thought of, but... And over time, I've begun to think of these writers, not in some magical way, but rather as people like you that I know. I know them, in fact, better than most of you. I've lived with them longer. I've seen more about what they think than what you think. And I have been posed repeatedly in, in down times and up times and hard times and good times. Are these guys reliable? <laughs> and and Paul, Paul is special to me because Paul has 13 letters. And they are letters. They're not like the Gospels, like Matthew. Matthew is hidden. You know, Matthew never says, I felt this, like I felt this, or I felt that. Paul, he's talking about himself all the time. You really get to know Paul when you read the letters of Paul. He talks about his angers. He talks about his anxieties. He talks about his failures. He talks about his successes. He talks about his conflicts. He, there's Paul all over the place. Whereas you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you meet Jesus. 
<laughs> and Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're kind of hidden back here. The, 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 the genre of a gospel was not to intrude themselves in there, but to tell the story. And yet, you can see the way they go about it, and you have to decide, is the Jesus they're presenting, and are they reliable? But with Paul, it's special. It's different. He's got so many letters, and you can kind of get to know this man. And he can become a friend. And he can either be a fool to you, or he can be a wise counselor to you. So I have, I have felt like it's almost a, a, like a thing with my wife. I can either trust her or distrust her. I can have this notion she's really always cheating on me. She's got to figure it out how to do it without me finding out. And she's not reliable. Well, this is possible. I could be totally deluded. She could, I mean, my wife is away from home hours every day. We don't see each other. That's possible. So am I going to live that way? And, and, and subjectively, you know what? I don't lose any sleep over that. <laughs> there is this profound, deep sense, which I don't feel is naive at all. She's not doing that. I trust her. Big time. And that's sort of the way I've grown with, to be with Paul. I just have I've lived with this man so long. I've struggled with what appear to be inconsistencies so long and found such deep and wonderful consistency. I, I've seen the way he handles conflict, and I've seen the way he talks about God that uh, I just can't reject Paul <laughs> as a friend and counselor and a wise knower of Jesus who had an encounter with him that I never had and had a unique call on his life. So, I, I mean, just personally, that's the way I relate to the Apostle Paul. This is Light and Truth, God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper continues our eight-part series, Why Believe the Bible, with a message titled, The Holy Spirit Testifies. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.